Nier Automata is profoundly, terrifyingly great. There's so much thoughtfulness and raw genius packed in that I've lived in fear that anything I could say about the game would do it an injustice. It is a work of art that delivers rich philosophical themes to its players and its characters, asking, analyzing, and answering fundamental questions about human existence, and it's all done using hot androids killing cute little robots within the greatest video game of all time. So I have to preface this by saying I'm not a philosopher. I just really dig philosophy when it's tied up into neat, calorie-dense finger food. Automata, however, transcends beyond finger food. It's gamer food, so it has Dorito dust. No, no that's gross, actually. Nier Automata is a dense, chocolate, Italian-sounding dessert that I can't pronounce with, like, some cute flowers on top, but there's also a pool of blood nearby, and you ask the chef, hey, what's up with the blood? And he just smiles at you, but you sort of get it? For me to fully express the way I feel about Nier is to do the impossible. When I first played Automata, I watched the game tie a perfect bow known as Ending E in complete awe. It was a defining moment in my life where I realized I had just experienced one of the greatest things, and I do mean things in general, not games, just all things. During that first playthrough, it was clear that Automata was unique. From the very first moments, it presented an overwhelmingly weird confidence. Everything that lives is designed to end. We are perpetually trapped in a never-ending spiral of life and death. Is this a curse? Or some kind of punishment? I often think about the god who blessed us with this cryptic puzzle, and wonder if we'll ever have the chance to kill him. It wouldn't be a YouTube video on Automata without it, but there could simply be no better opening to this game. It deserves to be overplayed. 2B's defining monologue sets the stage for everything that's about to play out while simultaneously implanting ideas that will soon be interpreted differently by a player who has fully experienced the approaching roller coaster that is near Automata. As I stand here thinking and looking back at my years of notes on Automata after four separate playthroughs, I still feel intimidated of the fact that I could never truly do this game justice. I feel unqualified to talk with any authority on the one game that I probably know better than some of my closest friends and even myself. How do I verbalize, analyze, contextualize my thoughts that are so tightly bound to emotions? Is for me to finally make a video about Automata a task of rationalizing feelings of love? A critique of centuries of profound thinkers that I can only pretend to understand? To look at a game, a masterwork of art that could easily be considered the highest achieved form of its medium as a whole? How On a grand level, the significance of Automata is how it stands as the strongest evidence that video games are the most personal storytelling medium. I've heard it echoed that Nier is not just a game. Nier is not, not just a game. It's definitively a video game, because a video game as a medium of raw potential is so much more than the understood bounds of the past. That is to say, Automata doesn't strive to be anything more than a game. It's not pretentious or overly self-indulgent. It proudly knows what it is and lifts the medium up because of it. It defines the highest point of what a video game can be. In the broad scope of story media alongside books, movies, shows, music, games have one layer of uniqueness, interactivity. Many games before Nier broke down the wall of player interactivity and used it to do commentary on the gaming sphere, but Automata took the idea enormously farther to inject profundity into the space in a way that would make any even casual onlooker of the evolution of games believe that the sky is not the limit, only human creativity is. Interactivity puts you into the story. You're holding a controller, you know it's not you, you know it's not real, but your actions are real. Games are often violent, you make the conscious brain-bound choice to kill, but does it matter? The average shooter disregards player agency, rightfully so. There's no real point in challenging the player's ethics in a game hyper-designed to appeal to people that look like the guy on the cover. But what if it does matter? A movie will continue to run regardless of if the viewer's watching. A book's pages will look identical whether or not they're turned. Nothing will happen without thousands of player decisions in a video game, small and large, and ones that run with that fact are able to convey stories in an unachievable way without the layer of interactivity. A lot of Automata puts you as the controller of the Android 2B. The use of robots in a story that runs on electronic hardware immediately can raise the question of 2B's autonomy. Are you controlling her as a third party, you or yourself, and you are controlling this robot as people do to robots? Or are you supposed to project onto her? Are you making choices for her or with her? In a video game, the are robot self-aware trope plays differently, because if the awareness of 2B is considered your own self, isn't this robot's consciousness the only external consciousness you alone can confirm? Let's put it this way, if a lamp in a video game uses real electricity, doesn't a 2B? 
To be asexualized, her outfit is revealing. She's hot. So the game has some expectations because of that. If you attempt to move the camera to look up her skirt, she moves away from the camera, demonstrating some free will from and to the player. So she's both being controlled, but also internally and externally aware. The game plays with this a lot, constantly, and pretty subtly. Right from the opening, it's established that the UI menus are components inside the Android that both you and they have control over. The fourth wall is broken a lot. It all adds up to a dichotomy of the player feeling both like an actor and a character in the same story. Everything, as far as I can think, is contextualized through Automata's narrative, which creates an experience that's possibly the first with the zero unintended ludonarrative dissonance. All conflicts between designed gameplay mechanics and the chosen narrative unify to convey the story rather than distract from it. Optional UI chips explain why you see a minimap and health bar in the entire OS. Reloading a save after death is restoring an older self. The combat loop of killing and not killing robots precisely conveys the themes through moment to moment gameplay. I seriously love when games do this. Another great instance is Celeste being about overcoming something difficult, and the game loop is overcoming challenging platforming. Your perseverance of climbing the mountain is the same as Madeline's, as it acts as a simulacrum to overcoming deeper struggles. Now is the part where I give you the spoiler warning. I'm going to assume you know the full story of Nier Automata. Seriously, do not watch the rest if you haven't played through the game. Since this isn't a review, I'm not trying to convince you to play it. Other people have already done incredible jobs at doing that. But the reason I'm making this video is because Nier is so unbelievably worth playing that if I can convince a single person to play this game after this review, it will have been seven days well spent. In a medium not exactly known for its love of pacifism or humanism, Nier Automata stands as a genre-defining work of art, one with a message that's vital and highly relevant to the current moment. And I can guarantee that, like me, there is a very sad, very big number of people that won't play this fantastic video game because, like me, they judged a book by its cover. They saw the trailer, the box art, the whatever, and decided right then and there what this game was and whether or not it was their cup of tea. I'll proudly stake what little credibility I might have on the assertion that I think the entire gaming industry, while celebrating Nier Automata, is drastically understating how incredible and important it is. Nier Automata is a rare breakthrough moment in the history of our medium. If you had told me a week ago that one of my top 10 games of all time would be replaced by this Japanese anime sci-fi hack and slash monstrosity, I would have laughed in your face. But here we are. Nier Automata is more than a fun game, or a good story, or a pretty soundtrack. It's the kind of experience that wants to try and change your life. And honestly, if you let it, and devote the amount of intellectual and emotional effort it clearly wants you to, I think it genuinely could accomplish that goal. So yeah, it's pretty good. Full spoilers ahead. Please don't let me be the one to ruin it for you. How are there like three massive perfect twists in the last hour of the game? 2B is actually 2E and it's alluded to from the very start. Every time she killed 9S is now fully recontextualized. Also the androids who thought they fundamentally had some meaning were only created to prevent the rest of the androids from realizing humanity was gone all along, taking away their own purpose of serving humanity. Androids who discovered their god was dead created a new god and disposable servants that would hold up the veil in front of it. And this was all written in a way that keeps the humanity is dead twist working for people coming in from the first near because Council of Humanity is so hammered in that it feels like a retcon. The entire our game that highlights finding meaning in a meaningless world was unknowingly a propagation of a lie to hide design meaninglessness in a tragic love story of the two pawns who were designed to neutralize each other. Okay, <laughs> alright, let's go back to talking about killing robots. Nier Automata uses a lot of genres of gameplay and it blends them seamlessly. Sometimes it's a platformer, bullet hell, visual novel, open world adventure, puzzler, RPG, shooter, fighter, but primarily hack and slash. Literally hack and slash, 9s hacks and 2b slashes. Did they discover this pun and base the entire game off it? Does it even mean the same thing in Japanese? Uh, I guess so. These frequent genre switch-ups are useful for keeping the game interesting because I think what defines the Drakengard and Nier franchise's heart is repetition. The most frequent game flavor of mercilessly killing robots shows the repetitive nature of their war. If combat was used sparingly and every interaction was designed to be new, it wouldn't cement the idea of their actions being that way. It's the same reason the game repeats itself leading from Route A to Route B. Repetition is used contrary to the fear of annoying the player because it's far more important to cement its core ideas before moving on to explore them in the rest of the game. Machines need to be dehumanized by 2B. The machines don't have feelings. Before 9S rehumanizes them in his own perspective that's hidden the first time through. Game design conventions are swept aside at the small cost of alienating some players. 
Also, before moving on from the combat, I have to say it's just so great. Platinum Games knows how to make delicious, buttery, gorgeous combat, and Automata will forever be one of the funnest games to me, even isolated from all the rest of its greatness. Like when I pick up this game for a new playthrough, it makes me feel the same way Mario's speedrunners must feel. It's basically second nature to me and continues to be so rewarding to master with how much depth is hidden in the movements and combos and weapon variety. In my last playthrough, I discovered you could get extra vertical height with the Mirage program like this. That's so cool. Beyond just establishing and building a new foundation atop the ideas of Route A, Route B forces the player to emotionally attach to the characters at the same time emotions are being given to the robots. Going through with Tubi's perspective of illuminate all machines, with just a hint of well maybe not all machines, is mirrored so that the player experiences Tubi's same evolution of thoughts. Information is withheld in a way that makes sense to be revealed through Ninus's hacking while also giving new meaning to the scenes that encourage the same reflection that Ninus experiences during that segment, unknown to Tubi. The first major new perspective scene is during the Simone fight. It also happens that Simone was the first instance of hacking gameplay from the player's perspective. Simone initially seemed weird and creepy as the punchline to a horror amusement park, but was obviously hiding something as many of the machines have, but it could be written off as just an insane robot that got fed too much human data. And in a way, that was true. She was driven to an extreme after trying to emulate human behavior to win the love of Jean Ball. If her story had been shown the first time, it's possible a player would see it and mentally resist the idea that maybe forcing women to conform to be valued, seen, and equal isn't a good thing, and ignore her end state. It guarantees the player thinks, dude that robot was messed up, so that when the reason behind it is shown, it's too late to not have that thought and lead into a deeper connection between the game's implicit mechanics and the presented ideals of existentialist feminism of Simone de Beauvoir. Machines work so perfectly in this story because they're established as something that is not human, only to hit you with the twist that machines and androids are the same, showing both that robots are more like humans than you thought, and maybe humans are more like robots than you thought. De Beauvoir worked to prove that the construct of femininity was not innate and was rather a result of patriarchal conditioning. The design of the machine boss Simone and the unraveling of her story elegantly demonstrates this idea because your own perspective of machines began as them being genderless and as the other before meeting them in the amusement park in Pascal's village where they've adopted familial roles, gender roles, societal roles, and are just trying their hardest to emulate a fallen world. Simone is a robot without a biological concept of gender, only living in the constructed bounds of binary distinction adopted from humanity. To be free from her torment, she would have to reject their conceptions of how she should be, reject the burden of femininity among machines that have a singular goal of accepting human limitations. I think it's pretty easy to come out of any given boss in Route B and still don't get what it was trying to say, but the messages can still work their way into you subconsciously. I love how it encourages exploration of the rest of the game and even the works that are referenced. Every side quest is just loaded with this stuff, it's great. Some people might not even realize the names are from the real world. It packs a lot of them into the relatively short duration, but luckily it goes beyond just name dropping smart people. It discusses their ideas in a digestible way while also giving its own opinion on them through critique and forcing the player to confront their own association with the topics through gameplay. It presents Pascal's wager, Jean-Paul Sartre's existentialism is a humanism, Marx and Engels seizing the means of production, Kant's deontology, Kierkegaard's leap of faith. These abstractions of humanist thoughts show machines trying to reach the top level of the hierarchy of human needs while the lower levels are shown in the more surface level of the game's plot. The recontextualization and humanizing of machines isn't even the only thing Nier uses its repetition for. Nier Automata only happens because the player engages with it. Even after breaking the cycle at the end, they are perpetually trapped in a never-ending spiral of life and death. Games can be replayed, so they will be. Each playthrough can be considered a different loop through the lives of the 2E-9S duality, and breaking past it shows how life is all about the struggle within this cycle. 9S's opening line has one surface level meaning during the first playthrough, even during the second time hearing it. But the third time, after you choose to play Automata again after seeing ending E, 9S looks past 2B and directly at you. Better make sure he's actually dead next time. I think he's talking about himself. Both of them are digital constructs who need their hands to be held through their tragic existence, trapped in a never-ending spiral by the many human gods over the artist Yoko Taro himself that Tubi never gets a chance to kill, but we do. Atomata drops the kill god line at the very start because it knows its audience. Tubi is bait. She attracts a lot of traditional JRPG fans to the Nier franchise who will immediately hear her opener and think, oh boy, another Japanese game where you kill god at the end. How original. They roll their eyes into the back of their head without realizing their cynicism that's being used to mask insecurity about the things they like is actually being used to set up for harder hitting plot twists. It's a game just begging for you to overlook it and expect nothing more than a shallow anime power trip. Nier uses these established tropes and expectations to explain its existentialism and present its characters in a line of creationism. At the bottom, the pods were created by the androids. They are gods to them that control their existence. To the androids, humans are their gods. They created them and they live to serve them. The humans have their own gods, and above all of them, the true creators 
of the universe, the names in the game's credits. To my understanding, existentialism explores the problems around human existence and the pursuit of meaning and purpose. While it loves to fully not commit to one singular topic, I feel that the pursuit of meaning is the outer shell holding all of it together. God is dead in Automata. Every interpretable god is dead. It shows androids and machines alike struggling with the futility of searching for life's meaning. It shows the field of thought that life's lack of meaning is reason enough to end it. At any moment of the game, every android is seconds away from suicide. It's right there in the OS. Hundreds of machines bring themselves to an end for all sorts of reasons, to become as gods or as a flawed conclusion to a lifetime of thought. The game rejects this, both in the way it's presented as flawed and Automata's most overwhelming and powerful message. There is futility in finding life's purpose, but the struggle within it and the inevitability of an end is what gives anything meaning. I so much reject the common thought that Nier is a franchise about sadness or leaves the player alone with existential dread, because it's almost the exact opposite. Finding your own purpose and deriving meaning from seemingly designed meaninglessness is the most optimistic thing there is. The story story gives tangibility to these ideas with the setup of Yorha and an extinction of humanity, so it can rip away all the flavor of Japanese storylines and anime robots, hold up a mirror in front of you and say, that's you, your god is dead. What will you do about it? Either of those things exist? They'll find out in the end. And so will we. Okay, that's grim. 2B and 9S contrast to show the fight between the urge to hide from this reality against the extreme will to discover it, and only once they finally break free are they able to pursue true, fulfilling purpose. For many within Nier, they find meaning in sacrifice. At first, 2B sacrificed her happiness and life to carry out the will of Yorha. Later, she sacrificed herself to save everyone. A2 does it to save 9S. Pascal does it for his village. Adam did it for knowledge and his brother. Nier for his sister slash daughter. Emil for his friends and pretty much everything. And in its final moments, Automata plays its final trick and asks you to make a sacrifice sacrifice of something tangible, your save data, to help a complete stranger that you will never meet, can never thank you, and might not even care. Am I insane, or is Nier just so devastatingly sad that it wraps around to euphoria? Our games? Silly little things? A future is not given to you. It is something you must take for yourself. Nier Automata is a mind-blowing game. It's unfathomably, outrageously incredible. It is something very special. I didn't even get into the soundtrack that makes a strong argument for the best soundtrack ever put in a game. The open world that uses its space in the same way as other all-time greats. The timeless visual style that softens itself along an edge of realism. It's a complete package that stands not only as the strongest singular title yet released, but a perfect video game sequel. I didn't even talk about Nier Replicant and how Automata masterfully evolves what it established while experimenting with new ideas and continuing the story in a way that retroactively lifts its own predecessor higher. Someday, a game will be made that will surpass Nier Automata. It might be years, it might be decades, it might not even be in our lifetime. But for now, whenever I'm asked what my current most anticipated game is, the answer is that game. I guess you could say that resting on the back of that game is the weight of the world. I put so much work into this video, I can't end it like that. How about I just ask you to think about f***ing that like button if you enjoyed and consider subscribing. Seriously, it means the world to me that you're watching and made it this far in. Any bit of support, be it sharing the video or leaving a comment, is extremely appreciated. Glory to mankind. It always ends like this. Come to life.